I thank God for his grace and mercy and giving us not only an opportunity to pray tonight, but an opportunity to praise tonight. And he came in by his spirit, and the praise was acceptable unto him. Somebody say acceptable. The praise was acceptable unto him. The music was acceptable unto him. The clapping of the hands was acceptable unto him. Our dance was acceptable unto him. Amen. Amen. I thank God for that tonight. Sometimes you need a refreshing. And times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And he is here tonight. And he's moving by his spirit. And he's moving according to his word. And the Bible says there is one spirit. And there's one Lord, and there's one God who is the Father of all. And when you have the Holy Ghost, he'll be in you all. Hallelujah. I give honor to God tonight, getting right to the word. I give honor to his son, Jesus. I give honor to the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's the one that came in and quickened us tonight. Quicken these old mortal bodies. These bodies that's been at work all day. Bodies been beat down, it's just now Tuesday. Bodies that need a little healing sometimes. Bodies that need deliverance. But he's quickening these mortal bodies to give us the strength to say, Yay, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. I give honor tonight to Bishop Joseph White. I want to thank God because it's a holy international organization that when you come to new life, it's just one church inside of a church that's on six continents around the world. And you walk into a family, the family of God, People that you haven't met yet, but to be praying for you, amen, that's going right along with you in serving the Lord. So I thank God for Bishop White in creating an international organization where the young, the old, the black, the white, the folks that don't speak English, but they all say glory to God. That kind of church, amen. I give honor tonight to the board of directors, to, to Elder Walter Jones, our district superintendent, a faithful man of God who supports this church and travels for the Lord. I give honor to you, Assistant Pastor Harris, and to the brothers that are in the house of God tonight. Let's give yourselves a hand, amen. You said yes to the Lord. You yielded to the Spirit, and you came back one more time to see what the Lord would have for you. I give honor to those that are watching today because we have people that watch. And they watch not just to see us, but they watch to hear what does say the Lord for them, no matter where they are in the world. So I thank God for the technology that we're using for good, amen. Somebody say for good good. And my topic tonight is, we shall be changed. I thank God that there's one Holy Ghost. And sometimes he will knock you off your feet when he confirms what he's given to you. And he confirms that you're on the right path and you're going in the right direction and that the Lord is well pleased. My topic tonight, we shall be changed. Amen. And I'm going to be writing a little bit tonight because it's Bible study. Somebody say Bible study. I thank God because I've studied a lot of things in my life and will continue to study things as I live in this life. But there's no better thing to study than the Bible, to show yourself approved of God, a workman that need not be ashamed, that when the Lord shall come back, he'll say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And for tonight's Bible study, we shall be changed in Bishop White was given definitions of certain words. So we're going to start out with some definitions I'm going to write. And then we're going to go right into the word of God. So the first definition is disposition. Disposition. And if it doesn't write on the board tonight, that is all right. We won't worry about that. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, it's, it stopped there, but that's all right. Sometimes technology doesn't work, but the spirit still works. So if you have your notebook, which is one of the reasons I encourage everyone to take notes, because sometimes you can't count on the technology, but you can always write the old-fashioned way. The first definition is disposition. Talking about Bible study, we shall be changed. Disposition, D-I-S-P-O-S-I-T-I-O-N. And disposition is a person's inherent qualities of mind in character. Your disposition is your inherent qualities of mind and character. First word is disposition. Studying tonight to 
show ourselves approved of God. Disposition. And when you get a chance, if you're at home, if you're not writing these down, you can find these words in the dictionary. Disposition. A person's inherit qualities of mind and character. So inherit is what you were born with. Some people come out the womb a nice baby. And you heard me say, oh, that baby's so nice. Some come out kicking and screaming. So we all start out with our certain disposition that we have inherited from our mother and father. In character, which is our second definition tonight, character, talking about we shall be changed. Character. And character is the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Talking about character. And if you don't have anything to write with, ask the Spirit to help you take it into your heart. So that these words, you'll remember what they are. So when we get to the scriptures, you can relate these definitions to the scriptures that the Spirit has given tonight. So the second definition is character. is the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. So your character is distinctively you. It's what separates you from the next person. And so we know some famous people like Martin Luther King talked about being judged by your character, which means a person should judge you based upon you and not somebody else because your character can be different than somebody else's character, even if you were brother and sister, raised the same. So one more time, character is the mental and moral qualities, your morality, what you think right and wrong is, why you do the things you do. That's your character. The third definition tonight is temperament. I'll spell that one out for you. It's T-E-M-P-E-R-A-M-E-N-T. Temperament. T-E-M-P-E-R-A-M-E-N-T. Temperament. Temperament is a person's nature especially as it permanently affects their behavior. Your temperament is your nature as it affects your behavior. Temperament is how you are to where it affects your behavior. So when it's storming outside, how does that affect your behavior? When someone says the wrong thing, how does that affect your behavior? When you get really happy about something, how does that affect your behavior? So your temperament is your nature and how it affects your behavior. Talking about we shall be changed tonight. And the final definition, number four, is personality. Personality is the combination of characteristics or qualities that form your individual distinctive character. Personality is the combination of the things we just read. It's the combination of your disposition. It's the combination of your character. Your personality is the combination of your temperament, how you think, how you act, your qualities that you have, all the things, how your behavior is, your morals. All of these things make your personality. And a lot of these things... Some of them you inherit when you're born as we started out. You just come out a certain way and you can choose to say, well, this is how I've always been. Some of them are taught to you. You pick them up in life. Maybe you had a good life, so you just got a happy character, happy personality. Maybe you had a bad life, so your personality is a little rough. Maybe you had good parents. Maybe you had bad parents. Maybe they treat you bad, whatever it is. So your personality has been formed into who you are today. But tonight we're talking about we shall be changed. And the Assistant Pastor Harris said in the end of her encouragement that we shall be changed now. Change me now, Lord, that you'll change me later. So the scripture we're going to, before we get to, is going to be 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. We shall be changed. So how does God know your disposition? How does God know your temperament? How does God know your personality? 
He knows by the Holy Ghost. Because God is in heaven sitting on the throne. Jesus is in heaven sitting at his right hand. So God knows these things about us, our disposition, our character, our temperament, and our personality, which is a combination of all these things. He knows it by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be with you. So he's with us when, he, when we react the wrong or the right way. When our disposition is good or bad. When our temperament is good or bad. The Holy Spirit is there to know these things and he reports them back to God. So over in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, the Bible says, well, first, when you get there, please say amen. 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 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. The Bible says, but we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. And on Sunday, we were encouraged that even looking now, starting out in the Lord, when we become a babe in Christ, we look through a glass and the Bible said, it's dimly lit or darkened. We can barely see. And I used the example of this plexiglass. So when you start out in the Lord, it's dim. We can barely see the Lord. We barely know his ways. We don't start out knowing how to pray right, how to fast right, how to preach. We start out as a child, and we barely see the Lord. And on Sunday, the Bible said that the Lord desires us to see him clearly, face to face. So in verse 18, it said that with an open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord is the Holy Ghost. And it said that when we see the Lord clearly, His glory, and Jesus is His glory, and the gospel of Jesus is His glory, and salvation is His glory. And when we see everything that God has planned for us, we see it clearly, we are changed. And He can change you when you know what his glory is for you, when you know that one day he desires for you to make it into heaven, to inherit eternal life, not just to make it into heaven, because the Bible says we're all going to be judged and the judgment seat is in heaven. So everybody's going to make it to heaven, but not everybody's going to stay in heaven. Once again, don't let the devil tell you that sounds strange. God judges everybody in heaven, which means whether you are a sinner or a saint, you're going to go. And you're going to get to that judgment that's in heaven. And you're going to see those pearly gates. And you're going to see the line of people. And you're going to see as much as you can see the foundations of Jasper and all these wonderful things. And standing at the judgment in heaven, he's going to either say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, or he's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. But we're all going to make it there. But the goal is not to just make it to heaven, but to make it there and live with him forever. So it says here that when we know this, we are changed by the Spirit of the Lord, by the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, we shall be changed. So if you turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 1. When we see the glory of the Lord, which is revealed unto us by coming to church on Sunday, Tuesday night Bible study, Friday night service, times you can make it to prayer. As his glory begins to be revealed unto you, if you have a willing mind, he'll begin to change you. It's like when you want a job. You'll prepare for it. Put your suit on, make the phone call, send the emails. You'll do something to try to get that thing that you desire. So the Bible says over in Ephesians, verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Why does God want to change us in his life? Before I start reading that, this is what we're talking about tonight. We shall be changed. And if the Bible just told us that when we see the glory of the Lord, 
We shall be changed by his spirit. You got to ask yourself, why does he want us to change in this life? And this is what we're going to find out in Ephesians. Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are in Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul starts out by letting you know that grace and peace comes from God. It also comes from Jesus Christ. So if you've never known that and you've just been praying to God, Ask for grace and peace. You can pray and ask him to not only send grace and peace from him, but grace and peace from Jesus as well. Sometimes you need a double portion of grace and peace that God would change your life, that he would change your situation. In verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. How many churches, and you don't have to answer, but in your mind, how many churches tell you that Jesus will bless you with all spiritual blessings? How, how many times have you heard that? How many times has that been the focus of a sermon, that Jesus will bless you with all spiritual blessings? I don't know about you, but I went a long time in my life, 20 plus years, never knowing that Jesus would bless me, not just with spiritual blessings, but with all spiritual blessings. I heard he would bless me with a car and a job and pay my rent and all these different things and, and health and strength and everything. But not too many people, not too many pastors, not too many noble and righteous people have told me that Jesus would bless me with all spiritual blessings. Well, where are you going with this, Pastor Harris? I'm talking about we shall be changed. And when someone tells you all the physical material blessings, those are external blessings that don't require you to change. You can get a house and still be the same on the inside. You can get a job and still be the same on the inside. And it can come to you by happenstance Someone can give you something that can be a blessing, and you can still be the same on the inside. But when it comes to the Lord blessing you with all spiritual blessings, we have to change because that's an internal blessing. That's something on the inside that he wants to do for us. And the Bible said that he will bless us with all spiritual blessings. And so the external blessings don't require you to change, but the internal spiritual blessings, they do require you to change. Verse 4 says, according as he have chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What are we talking about over in Ephesians? We're talking about the glory of the Lord that 2 Corinthians was talking about. The Bible is explaining to us what this glory of the Lord is that we shall see, that then we shall be changed. This is breaking down this glory of why we should be here tonight, that we should change. The Bible said that according as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What are the spiritual blessings? Is that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Natural blessings cannot create holiness and without blame before him in love. But when we are changed on the inside by the Holy Ghost, as the Bible said, by the Spirit of the Lord, it can create this holiness that we can be without blame before him in love. The Bible says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Why is it again that he wants to bless us with all spiritual blessings? Verse 6 said that he would be, we would be made accepted in the beloved. 
this change that God is trying to do in us is that we would be acceptable unto him. Because again, one day we're all going to the judgment seat. We're all going before the Lord. And he will judge us according to our deeds. And so he's making a way of escape, as the Bible says, from a crooked and perverse generation. He's making a way of escape from all the things that we see going on that we don't have the power to change. But God has the power to change us so that we can escape the wrath in the end. We shall be changed. The Bible says to make us accepted. That's why we have to be changed, that we can be made accepted. Verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. God desires to change us on the inside, to fill us with the Holy Ghost, to, for us to allow the Holy Spirit to change us, for us to yield, so that we can have redemption through his blood, so that we can have the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 8 says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Jesus has abounded toward us in all wisdom, in all prudence. And the extra definition for tonight, prudence. Most people have heard of wisdom. In the world you hear about wisdom. But what about prudence? I hadn't heard of prudence until I read it in the Bible. What is prudence? The definition of prudence Careful, good judgment that allows someone to avoid danger or risk. Prudence is careful, good judgment that allows someone to avoid dangers or risk. God is designed to change us by the Holy Ghost to help us to have careful, good judgment in every situation that avoids the danger and risk of going to hell, that avoids the danger and risk of missing out, that avoids the danger of risk of being led astray. Careful, good judgment is what he desires to change us with. My judgment hasn't always been careful. My judgment hasn't always been good. My judgment hasn't always avoided dangers because I have made judgments that has led to danger. My judgment haven't always avoided the risk in life that could take us out. But he desires to change us on the inside by the Holy Ghost tonight that we can have this prudence, not just wisdom. Wisdom just means you know stuff. But prudence is, is when the time comes, will you use that wisdom that, the, that God can give you to make a careful and good judgment and a good decision that's going to help you to avoid the danger. The danger that Satan brings that will cause you to risk your salvation. He wants to change us tonight. And sometimes the danger is in just what we say. And it's in what we do. But the Bible says, it says that in verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purpose in himself. My mother used to always say, God works in mysterious ways. It's only mysterious when you don't know. It's only mysterious when you don't know how God works. It's only mysterious. 2 Corinthians started out that said that when we would see clearly like a glass, that when we would know of God's glory, when we would know what we read so far, that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he's called us to be holy without blame before him, that he's done all these things he desires to change us. It's not mysterious when the Lord begins to tell you that you need to change, that he begins to tell you that there is a Holy Ghost who is the power of God. It's not mysterious when I look at you and you don't sound the same anymore, you're not doing the same things anymore, that you have now turned to God. That's not mysterious. But when we find ourselves in darkness, it's mysterious. Turn out the lights in here. I can't tell you how to navigate around because it will become a mystery. But when I can see clearly, it's not a mystery where the drums are. It's not a mystery where the organ is. It's not a mystery where Brother Garrett is. If he gets up and moves, I can still see him. But when I'm in darkness, he can move and I don't know where he is. And that's how it is when we don't allow the Holy Ghost to change us. Because the Spirit can say, I want to give you some charity. I want to give you some kindness. But if I'm in darkness, it's mysterious to me what God wants. And I'll continue with my rough, hard self moving to the left while the Spirit's moving to the right. Allow the Lord to change you tonight. The Bible says, 
The reason he wants to do this, the reason he's making known unto us the mystery of his will, which is for us just to be holy and acceptable before him, that's all it is. God's will is for us to be holy and without blame before him. It says the reason he wants to do this in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that means on God's time, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. This is talking about the rapture when Jesus comes back. It's talking about that great day, as we say, when he will crack the sky. When he comes back bringing those from heaven and he comes back and brings us up from heaven, from earth, it's talking about that day that he'll make those that are alive and those that have already died in Christ one. This is why he wants us to change. That when the time comes, in verse 10, he might gather us together in one. All things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things. Talking about learning about this glory of God tonight, seeing it clearly as through a glass, and then allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. That when we realize we have been predestinated according to the purpose of him, you can allow the Lord to change you because you realize it's not your purpose anymore. My life, the way I lived it, is not according to my purpose anymore. It's not about where I want to live. It's not about the job that I want to have. It's not about who I even wanted to be, but it's according to God's purpose because he predestinated everyone tonight according to his purpose. Who he wants you to be, where he wants you to go. The Bible says the bounds of your habitation. The Bible says he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. The reason he wants us to change tonight is I close out with the last two scriptures. He wants to change you that you can be to the praise of his glory. Just like when you get a good grade and they call you and they tell you about the good grade and it's like you give them praise like oh you did a good job I'm so proud of you that's how the God of heaven is he wants to change us and do all of this just so we can be to the praise of his glory that is what it means when we get to the judgment and he says well done that is the praise of his glory. Y'all did a good job. You held on. You didn't let the world take you out. You didn't let the situations cause you to turn away. But you kept coming to church. You kept praying. You kept fasting. You kept believing. You had this charity. You hope in all things. You believe in all things. You endure in all things. The Lord wants to change us. That he can say, well done. That we can be to the praise of his glory. That when he sits in heaven with the council, that they can say, but she held on another day. It says that in verse 12, I'll read that again, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also trusted. Tonight you've trusted the Lord, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. As 2 Corinthians said, as we read, after you have seen clearly through a glass the glory of the Lord, which is the gospel of your salvation, it said we are changed by the Spirit of the Lord. This scripture here said the same thing, that after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit we shall be changed. Because after you heard the word of truth, you believed. And it brought you thus far. And tonight I want to encourage you that the Lord desires to change you by the Holy Spirit. The whole purpose of coming to church is to be changed. There's no other reason we are here. It's not just to give God the praise. He doesn't need our praise. He's God all by himself. He said if he needed anything, he wouldn't even tell us. Because there's nothing we can give him that he can't get for himself. But we praise him because he said to praise him. But that's not why we come to church. We come to church to be changed. That he can change us in this life. That he'll change us for the life to come. 
that our body will be changed from mortal to immortality, that we'll be able to go to heaven and hear well done and live with him all the rest of our days. My final scripture is verse 14, talking about the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. It doesn't have to be a mystery to you tonight that God desires to change you, to change your ways, to change your disposition, to change your character, to change your temperance, to change your personality, change your temperament, to change everything that's about you so that you can be holy and without blame. If there's something he can blame about you and your disposition, he can change it tonight. If something in your personality causes you to be blamed before God, something he doesn't like, he can change it by the Holy Ghost. If your temperament hasn't been pleasing unto God your whole life, he desires to change you by the Holy Ghost. If your personality, you can't say, well, I've always been this way, it's going to always be this way. Not if you believe on Jesus as the scriptures have said. Not if you're trying to go to heaven. Not if you desire to not get turned away when you get there. He can change you. The Bible said, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The Holy Ghost is the first part. It's the first fruit. It's the down payment. It's like good earnest money. When you say you want to buy something, we put down earnest money on that organ. And we got it sitting here right now. Because the earnest money said we are invested in that and we want that. So the Holy Ghost is God's earnest money in your life. He gives them to you and it's an investment in you. And he says, I give you my spirit and he's going to work on you to the end until I'm ready for you. We're going to pay on that organ until the end until it's completely ours. God will give you the spirit and he will work on you until the end until you're completely his. Because until that day, we can go back. And we won't be his. We can turn that in until it's paid off. But once that organ's paid off, it is ours. And the man who gave it to us has no more control over it. But until that point, we got to do what we got to do to make sure we pay it off. And until Jesus comes back, he wants to change you day by day, hour by hour, situation by situation, so that when the day of salvation comes, you'll be completely his. We shall be changed that we will be to the praise of his glory. That he'll say, well done, thy good, for, good and faithful servant. He'll say, well done, your disposition is not how it was when I found you. He'll say, well done, your character is now blameless. He'll say, well done, your temperament is now exactly how it should be. He'll say, well done, your personality is one that when people see you, they see my son Jesus. That when they hear you speak, they hear my word. That when you shouldn't have patience, I give you patience. I give you peace that passes all understanding. When nobody else can understand, how does he or she have peace in this? You'll be able to say, but the peace of God that passes all understanding will rest and rule and abide within you as we stand tonight. We shall be changed. He wants to change you in this life, that he can change you for the life to come. And the change for the life to come is the best and the final change. And that's when we will inherit eternal life. That's when all of our labor will not be in vain. It's that day is when your labor will not be in vain. That day. Not any day before then. It's that day when you hear him say, well done. Your labor would not be in vain. Allow the Lord to change you. Amen. Let's lift our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, Brother Garrett, or anybody at this time, if you would like to join this church, before we pray, and I want to encourage you, join in what joining this church means. Joining this church means that you have agreed to how the Holy Spirit is leading according to the word. Joining this church doesn't mean anything about Pastor Harris, Sister Pastor Harris, the music, the building. 
because we can have a different building. But joining this church means that when you came to this church and you kept coming back, all you received was the word of truth. Because the scripture just told us that, that in you that believed after you heard the gospel of your salvation, Joining this church means that you acknowledge that you heard the gospel of your salvation here. And that's all you've heard. And that's all you want. It's the gospel of your salvation. And when you join New Life, Church of the Living God International, if you decide to do that, because we don't force anybody, because God doesn't force anybody. But if you decide to join this church, what you're joining is an international church organization. And what that means is there are other people around the world with the same Holy Ghost, with the same Lord, with the same God that believe the same Bible. That everything that you've seen in this local single church, there are others that can get a prayer through. There are others that are speaking in their heavenly language. There are others that the Lord is on their side. That there's somebody around the world that can be prayed for you when you can't pray for yourself. That's what it means when you join this church. And above all, it means that you told the Lord, yes, I want to change. Lord, that I will stick around and allow you to change me. And what that also means, lastly, is that you're going to lean on the Lord and truly allow him to change you. And to lean on the Lord and allow him to be your defense when the enemy comes. Because when you join a church, not just the people in the church know it, but Satan knows it. And I've seen too many times where someone joins a spirit-filled church. I'm not talking about just a church. A spirit-filled church where the Holy Spirit resides and things happen in the spirit realm, which is also where Satan resides. And what happens is you join a spirit-filled church, the enemy, the adversary, he gets busy because he knows you joined the place that's going to lead you to well done, that good and faithful servant. And he will fight all his might to take you out. And so when you join this church, you have to lean on the Lord. If you were to join tonight, it may be before you get home that the enemy will try to steal everything from you. It may be before the next service that he'll try to change your mind. That the job will tell you you can no longer have off on Sunday. You can no longer have off on Tuesday and Friday. Just so happens to be the church days. It, it may be that your best friend will call you and talk you out of going to church. The Bible says tell the truth in love. So if you decide to join this church where the spirit dwells, be ready for a spiritual battle. But what I want to encourage you in, the battle is not yours to fight. And it's already won. But all you have to do is hold on to God's unchanging hand and walk in the spirit and let him change you. Whereas your previous disposition will make you flee in the sign of trouble. Your temperament will cause you to get upset and not come back. Where your personality and your character will say, I can't take all this. Everything was doing good before I joined that church. You will realize that the spirit is there to help you because he was there when you joined the church. And as long as you don't leave him, He'll never leave you. And at this time, if there's anybody that would like to join New Life Church of Living God International, I ask that you will come down to the front of the church.